Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie from NASA Ames Research Center. I'm a chemical engineer over there, um, working as a mission support engineer. Today, I wanted to talk about SPLICE, our sample processor to enable the search for life on icy worlds. Specifically, what we're going to be talking about is a microfluidic front end um, to interface with capillary electrophoresis or mass spec or a number of different analytical instruments. Uh, specific to processing samples um, from ocean worlds and Celadus in Europa. We had, two, we had multiple configurations for SPLICE, some for plume sampling, some for lander sampling, in which case each of, our, uh, each of our sample requirements were different. But specifically, we're looking at doing biomarker detection, habitability characterization, and building on our previous, uh, previous Mars missions, Viking and Phoenix, which utilize some of these same types of um, characterization techniques. So an overview of what we're trying to accomplish. On these missions, we're looking at doing automated sample handling of some very dilute, low concentration samples. So what we have is some sort of sample collector and a fluidics processor that interfaces to a, num to a giant an uh, analytical instrument suite. So for a fluidics processor, we need to do a number of things, including extracting the solution, um, sampling out particles, degassing, adjusting ionic strength or removing ions, adjusting pH, adjusting polarity, um, and eventually just delivering to the number of instruments that we are uh, interfaced with. So in order to accomplish this, we went through a process of starting with component level testing. We had an idea of the things that we needed to accomplish, and we started by miniaturizing these into smaller component pieces that we could test individually. So shown here, you have some bubble traps, check valves, dry reagent storage, precision metering pumps, and a concentrator that's used to all process the samples in different ways. After analyzing the uh, capabilities of these instruments, we then integrated them into a number of manifolds. And so here you can see that what we've accomplished is development of microfluidic manifolds that behave like fused multilayer monoliths. So there's a number of cut channels down to 250 microliters or up to one milliliter approximately in diameter um, that run through these channels uh, or that run through these manifolds to handle either two microliter or um, larger milliliter sized samples from these missions. So SPLICE 1.0 was the original OG <laughs> uh, manifold that we, we established. Um, and this was made for MCE and a uh, connection to a micro-wet chemical lab. Um, and so you can see a number of the components there. This then increased uh, in complexity when we developed SPLICE MS. And here the big thing being the, uh, the connection to the mass spectrometer. And then finally into SPLICE 2.0. Which, collected to, which connects to a microcapillary electrophoresis instrument, a microwet chemistry lab, as well as a mass spectroscopy uh, suite. So in the case of all of these manifolds, um, each of these components were again tested individually and then integrated into one full suite that takes samples and allows them to be processed and delivered to multiple instruments. In a lot of the cases we're working um, or in, in all of these manifolds, we are working with flight heritage uh, 50 microliter pumps and solenoid valves. And the integration of these manifolds is down on the scale of inches. So each one of these manifolds is about five inches by five inches. And its uh, weight is only about half of a kilogram. So previous uh, talks have kind of talked about some of these um, capabilities that we have. But one of them is to go and connect to a sample collector. Um, to wet out that sample collector and then retrieve all of the particles from that collector to move into the manifold. With that, we also have the ability to concentrate these particles um, on the order of 5x concentration from 35 microliters down to 7 microliters within a 20 minute span, um, as well as a number of uh, other autonomous um, processes. So specific, specifically with the uh, autonomous development, we've developed flight uh, hardware um, to control all of our valves, pumps, et cetera, to actually move these samples where they need to go. So some routine functionality. Um, we have dry reagent storage on board, as well as bubble mitigation and pressure and temperature sensing. 
When I say routine functionality, I mean these aren't things that are specialized, but they are very incredibly necessary for the sample handling that we're trying to accomplish out on Enceladus Europa deep space missions. Dry reagent storage, of course, is very, very uh, powerful to have um, to reduce your volumes inside of the instrument, uh, as well as to have um, good control of, of concentrations within your manifold. Bubble mitigation, we've had a number of types of bubble traps, which we've all proved to work before. Um, but the, the nice uh, improvement in Splice 2.0 that other manifolds haven't had is the integrated pressure and temperature sensing um, with the use of Honeywell pressure sensors shown there. So with dry reagent storage, what we've done is we've uh, taken these porous polymer monoliths and actually dehydrated reagents onto the monoliths and found that with rehydration, we can generally get back about 90% of what we have put onto the monolith to use for other processes. So we have a characterized reconstitution of dry reagents from absorbance measurements by using, um, and that we have characterized by using a single point detector, um, which takes absorbance measurements to then see what's coming off of the monoliths that we can uh, characterize and use. So important to this was the concentration control. What often happens with the dry reagent storage is that as the reagent is rehydrating, especially if the kinetics for the reagent are very quick, you get a very high concentration front and a very low concentration tail. So if you look in this concentration curve here, you can see that on a, normal, on a regular uh, rehydration, you start up with a concentration that's at or above 100% that drops down to zero. Um, but in the case of staining, uh, staining cells, staining um, any sort of uh, materials that we want with fluorescent tags and things, you really want a uniform concentration that you can deliver to those uh, samples to be able to get the best, um, to be able to get the best fluorescence or the best uh, analysis of your samples. And so the way that we've done this is we've actually developed a method for concentration control by dilution at a T. So we use uh, irregular water dosing to take the enriched front, front and turn it into a uniform concentration that we can deliver to our sample. So another, uh, another, another use that we have found, um, which in the case of dry reagent storage, that's something that we have to have. But in the case of air gap generation, this is a feature that we, de we determined after the fact to be useful for our process. So air gap generation is using our bubble traps reverse of the way that they were meant to be used. So rather than capturing bubbles, you are now creating bubbles to create uh, electric isolation or to create electrical resistance inside of the manifold. So in the case of mass spec, um, there's high voltage systems up to 20 kV that are being employed in order to analyze the sample. And one of the concerns is then uh, worrying about the electrical components that are on the manifold. And so by having um, secondary protection against those types of, uh, those types of voltage output systems, um, we're helping prevent, you know, mitigating risk basically within our manifold. So the nice thing about this air gap generation that we, we learned was that it didn't matter how fast we created these air bubbles or how slow or how fast we dispensed them for that matter. We could get very, very consistent output um, for the displacement that we wanted. So if we pulled five microliters, it didn't matter uh, whether it was at 50 microliters per second or 0.2 microliters per second. We were always getting a five microliter bubble that we could use um, for that secondary production. So the next part is the uh, in the in more recent times is uh, sensor development and contact ISEs specifically for sample characterization. Um, contact ISEs have a bad rap sometimes for being very finicky, um, and I think this is something that needs to continue to be developed as time goes on. But what we've done is we've actually developed, or what we found is that we can get pretty uh, consistent results from our excitation and our currents when we're taking conductivity measurements. So specifically, um, below saturation, uh, a lot of our, we're, we're able to take good measurements on conductivity to make relative assumptions about what's happening inside. Um, more development needs to be done on this, but one of the special features has been the compact form factor development where we've started including multiple electrodes inside of small diameter fittings. So overall, this project has been sort of a, a maturation of technologies and a furthering of 
elements that we knew that worked before, but combined together to be able to move this into an autonomous out, uh, icy world situation. Um, so in the process of making these three manifolds, what we've seen is a reduce in dead, uh, reduction in dead volume, you know, reduction in power requirements, improvement of the features that we had made to be onto there, um, the increase in capabilities for temperature monitoring, um, as well as the increased capabilities for dry reagent storage, and then the potential for ISC uh, monitoring. So overall, we have increasing experimental capability, and we have a transferable technology development that could be useful for any IC world mission, let alone any uh, habitability characterization mission that might be interested in any of these types of um, functions. So special thanks to Team Leia. I think uh, Richard Quinn is here today, and he'll be giving a talk later this week. Um, this was funded in part by NASA for cons uh, the Coltec program. And for more information, you can talk to Tony Rico, listed there. Questions for Can your pH probe measure the pH of a sample that's a few microliters? Yes, depending on what you mean by a few microliters. Um, the tendency of the microfluidity design is to use very, very small ISEs and to use very, very small channels. And so if they're miniaturizing everything, that is what we're aiming to get to. Great, yeah. thank you. All right, let's go ahead and thank Leslie one more time.